Okay, I'm Kenny Jai from Loughborough University, and as uh, Roger said, I'd uh, Malcolm to uh, thank for uh, giving me my job at Loughborough. Uh, originally, I worked with, uh, with Roger as a postdoc, but when uh, Malcolm came to uh, Loughborough, he brought uh, he brought all his uh, expertise and connections and connections to EDF, and they funded a uh, a lectureship at Loughborough, and I applied it, and Malcolm gave me my job, so I'm very grateful to Malcolm for that. And uh, it's a pretty good opportunity to, uh, to be working with him, even for a short time. I've got quite a lot to talk through. Uh, we'll cut you off if you go over. So yeah, so I probably get through quite all of that because I think Roger wants to go home and fly. But um, I'll um, start with the uh, motivation, which has been uh, mentioned a little bit uh, already, as we're interested in modelling uh, graphite, because it's its use in uh, nuclear reactors, and because a nuclear reactor is a very uh, high it's a temperature, high radiation environment, this, uh, these conditions damage the graphite and every atom gets displaced some about 20 something times and uh, this causes damage and dimensional change in the graphite. And this graphite is not perfect. Uh, when, we, when we do these com small computer models we, we just look at small crystals, single crystal uh, graphite, but in reality it's a very complicated uh, microstructure. And this is some of the uh, Micrographs that were obtained by uh, Benjamin Miles at Loughborough, which we published uh, last year. Uh, so, as you increase the amount of uh, neutron fluids, amount of radiation, and into a piece of graphite, you get this dimensional change. So, you see some of this initial contraction and then expansion in, uh, in the graphite. And uh, this dimensional change, uh, which is what fits bricks within the nuclear reactor core, it, it's nowhere for the uh, material to go, so it tries, it can't do anything, it just, it just crack. So we want to understand, <coughs> understanding where, where these cracks form and uh, when they're going to form, it goes back to understanding how, uh, how this dimensional change comes about due to the radiation damage. And this is uh, some, some slides from, uh, from Malcolm's work and there's others in this group. This is Malcolm's model, which has really been talked about a lot about this uh, buck work and tuck model. So if you, uh, insert, if you insert extra material in here by gliding dislocations, they uh, form this uh, buckle and it rocks and tucks underneath like that and it forms this sort of extra sort of half plate in the middle. And this causes, as you see, causes this expansion in the C direction. So one of the first uh, things I I did when I got to Loughborough is uh, well, I saw well and good like this, but I, I was wondering, can you? Uh, how is this going to happen on a, on a larger scale? And uh, what sorts of things do, would happen if I just took a big piece of uh, graphite and just compressed it or pushed material in from the side. I'll uh, point out uh, some uh, experimental results that, that Ben obtained as well where you, where you looked at some of these kink bands and the thing to note is that when you have a sharp kink band in graphite you do get these sort of triangular shaped voids. So one of the first things I did was, was took a sort of thin wafer of graphite and just compressed it uniformly on the edge and you just do that you get these sharp kink bands. And I think this just comes about because of the, uh, the geometry of the layer structure. But if you allow uh, space for the graphite to expand in the C direction, so this is just the same thing, just crushing everything from the edge, but there's a void for the graphite to expand in the C direction, then you get these sort of kink bands and these sort of triangular voids appear. But if going back to, uh, to 
mounted up model back here and you insert an extra layer of material and you get these buckles. If you have a uh, sort of a sharp uh, indentation into the side of a thin wafer, then we do readily seal, we do readily see uh, folding and buckling of multiple layers like this. So I thought that one way of getting some of this extra material into, uh, into the centre of a grain to form these bubbles would be that if you had this complex microstructure of one piece of grain pushed into the, into the side of another, that would give a source for where this extra material could come from and cause this large structures to bubble. So, when we're dealing with radiation damage, we want to be modeling the, uh, these interstitial spiro defects that we use to, uh, which, which we, which we um, use to pin the layers of bugger back to here, these, uh, these uh, interstitial defects to sort of pin some of these uh, buckles in the structure. So in order to model uh, larger structures over long <coughs> time scales and uh, model these spiro and uh, the split interstitial structures. We needed a more uh, more simple model than DFT, so we could run molecular dynamics simulations. And there are of existing, there, are, there must be hundreds of uh, potentials for, uh, for carbon literature so we just the most common ones is the Revo and Eden and uh, what we what we found is that although they're very good at getting a lot of things right they get some of these uh, defect structures that get the formation energy energies wrong and they disagree with the uh, DFT results. So the first one of the next things we did was we fitted a um, a reacts FF potential uh, using uh, results from the, the DFT. So this uh, this plot, there's there's a whole range of um, small defect structures that were calculated by Bislav and using AIMFO. So we calculated all of these structures in DFT, and we gave those to Andrew Mountain to fit. A set of parameters for reacts FF to obtain a, uh, a reacts FF fitting that would uh, get a good uh, agreement and a good model, sort of good model of the, uh, the defect structures in graphite. So this is sort of a general sort of thing we find. We do find that the, the stable ones are this split interstitial and the most stable there. Uh, Structure is this uh, spiral interstitial, which we're all quite all familiar with. And we also um, we also fit this uh, Dean stone whales defect. It's usually known as stone whales in the, in the literature and on Wikipedia. But, uh, if you look through the literature, I think it was first described by uh, by Dean in 1952. So me and Roger have been trying to propose. Others, we should, we should call it the Dean Stone defect or something like that. And we find that uh, this uh, reacts of F potential was, was fitted to, uh, to these, this reaction pathway, and it's it quite a high energy to form this uh, to form this defect. So, although a radiation damage event damage the structure to create this is not going to be something that will happen randomly. The next thing we looked at is uh, vacancy uh, diffusion. So uh, again this is using us a bit of the expert potential and it always finds this uh, sort of cross structure like that. Which doesn't uh, isn't uh, it's not a predicted stable uh, structure in DFT, but 
that it's, it always comes out in the Reacts Club and it comes out in the Revo as well. But the most important thing is that the um, diffusion barriers when you think are roughly, roughly agreeing to what we expect. So that's a quick uh, ND simulation. So this was just on the ND uh, with our reactor effect potential. And as soon as it gets going, you see this uh, single vacancy diffuses about. So we generally see diffusion barriers of, of order 0 0.7, 0 0.5, 0.7 mV to, for this uh, single one to play you can see to uh, diffuse around graphite. So again, uh, this is a longer time scale so simulation is performed uh, by year and it's done two simulated vacancies and they eventually move around and merge to form this die vacancy structure. So, you, so, the, so these single atom vacancies are quite mobile, but then uh, once they meet and form this die vacancy, we found that to be quite immobile and they didn't move in that any further in our simulations. Another interesting thing is that if you have a single atom vacancy, but one in one layer and one in the layer above, they, uh, these single atom vacancies move around if they end up on top of each other. You can see it even, you can get this bonding between layers, so this atom, the atom has just got two bonds on it, and it's a little more free to move up and down, and this can uh, you know, fluctuate and pinch together, it forms this bond between the layers, and then eventually this one jumped up, so you ended up with uh, the red layer is a perfect um, hexagonal layer and then a, a die vacancy which we made a mobile in the second layer. So we can see that these uh, single atom vacancies can, we think, merge across layers to form these die vacancies. And I think to note, we, we looked at uh, the diffusion of these spirals as well and we found that uh, this diffusion barrier for movement of these spirals is about 1 EV is predicted by this uh, reactive effort potential, um, which, is not, which is a little bit higher than the uh, diffusion barriers for the, uh, the vacancies. So it's quite strange in graphite, the, the, uh, the vacancies are the things that move around and these spiral interstitials are the things that are best known by. Whereas if you had a metal, is the interstitials that shoot around the grey boundaries and the vapors and the less mobile methods, but they seem to the other way around to the graphite. Uh, Ying also found a transition where these uh, spirals can jump between layers because the energy barrier was quite high, which was found in the aspect about 1.7 UV, but running MD at 2000 Kelvin. It, it's an event that, that, that occurred after a few nanoseconds of simulation time. You can see this, uh, see this spiral jump between layers. Another interesting, uh, interesting thing is that uh, if you have um, two or more spirals in a layer and heat the system up and relax it, you can find that these interstitial atoms can form these, these chains of other ring structures between the layers and these, and these structures on this to the bottom are slightly lower in energy than the um, isolated spiral interstitials. So another simulation that you performed was to put something like 20 spirals in one layer heat the whole system up to uh, 2,000 Kelvin and just see how the, see what happens as these diffuse around and they form a, sort of a ring type structure which was fairly, fairly mobile between them there. and again another, another structure, these simulations were started with two small platelets so this one had two 16 atoms 
platelets in the simulation, and this one had three separate, uh, separate platelets. And these were simulations we gave one of sort of 2,000 Kelvin and just started to evolve over time. And we see that these structures merged into a single platelet, and then uh, once you get that to uh, okay, seven nanoseconds of uh, simulation time, these platelets form sort of hexagonal uh, arranged uh, carbons with uh, sort of minor defects on the edges. Uh, you know, so looked at uh, different size uh, platelets and one of these again uh, several several nanoseconds, about 0.9 nanoseconds of simulation time for this one. This one just uh, so this was the initial configuration of the platelet between layers and then it just ended up like this. So, so we think uh, so we think that these these uh, the platelets are quite quite stable structures within graphite once they form. Of course, once they, they form, they form a sort of a local uh, bubble from the uh, ripple in the, uh, in the center between the two layers. Uh, yeah, so uh, one thing, another thing you can look at is if you add more atoms in one layer, you can look at how this affects the sea lattice expansion. So, it's quite obviously put in an extra platelet, there's an extra small layer of uh, graphite in there which causes this expansion of the sea formation. So moving on to some other work uh, that we're looking at about uh, uh, how the radiation damage affects uh, the graphite. Uh, if we have, uh, so these are, these are radiation damage uh, cascade simulation. So what we have is a large structure of graphite and then you just choose one atom up here and give it 500 dB of kinetic energy to send it flying down through the lattice. So this was a this was one of the, the good ones where the atom can fly straight down and then just stop straight on our spiral interstitial great. But in the actual uh, simulations they don't all do that. So this is one. This is another simulation that uh, we have performed. And in this case, we send an atom flying down here, and it, and it just causes two displays. It, it has a collision here and sends one atom flying up there. And another collision here and sends another atom flying up there. So you end up with one, two, and three vacancies labeled up here, and then three. Of metastable defects. So none of those were spirals, and we wanted, we kind of expected that this, this uh, simulation would just all collapse to, to spiral. So uh, they formed these sort of strange metastable defects. So what's, uh, what's going on? What's going on with that? But if you t if you take one of these. Uh, and to say the defects and, and, uh, and say, well, we know we want, we want this to relax towards the spiral structure, so we just displace the atom a little bit to make it form a spiral and relax that structure. So if we have this one, we don't want to have that. We can just do a nudge elastic band uh, calculation and just find the minimum energy <coughs> path between this state and this one. And when you do that, we find that there's about 0 0.6, 0 0.7 EV energy value for this sort of metastable structure to decay down to a spiral. So what we think is that uh, even in this simulation, if we was to run it at a high enough temperature for long enough, these, these interstitial defects would uh, decay down for you know, spiral structures. Either pin the layers or diffuse the pin on the temperature. Uh, I did some uh, sort of thermal expansion uh, simulations as well. So uh, this these types of simulations are quite quite simple. So I just started with uh, sort of single crystal graphite, about 16,000 atoms, 
and just run run some MD using our React stuff and a Revo just to compare what they do. And uh, you just run them with like a well, hundred piece of information because of good, uh, good statistics and uh, they need each each temperature and you can measure get a good time average for the uh, uh, lattice dimensions. So um, in a rebo you see uh, it's quite large. Um, sort of C. Yeah this is this so this this plot is the C lattice expansion, so it's the expansion between <coughs> the, the layers apart and apart from each other. So you see this this expansion of the C lattice parameter is a little over predicted by Vivo. We actually guess yes, the gradient is a little bit better than the closer to experimental thoughts. But the actual predicted uh, lattice parameters, the Vivo is a little bit better on the actual lattice parameter. The we actually fitting sort of under underfit what the C lattice should be. Um, we did the same thing looking at the, uh, the expansion in the, in the A or we did it in the in the plane direction. In a uh, previous version of the uh, LAMPS, I think the simulation that uh, Tom Giraffe did, the Arebo potential did show a, a small contraction of the expansion. But I think there might have been something some bug in the code or something because if you, look, if you do the same calculation in the latest version of LAMPS you see that the Arrivo potential just predicts expansion of the, uh, of the A uh, in plane direction. The experiments show this slight contraction in the expansion in the A direction. Reactor FF, our Reactor FF fitting shows the sort of general trend but it's still under predicted by quite a bit. So a future work on this part would be to uh, to see how this is affected, see how the external properties are affected by uh, the inclusion of the interstitials and the vacancies. Um, so way out of time then. <laughs> um, We've got two minutes. Two minutes. What, what's the most interesting? Um, I'll just say two minutes about some of the later work that we're looking at. So, as I, men as I mentioned before, the uh, real graphite in a nuclear reactor is not a perfect single crystal HOPD or anything like that. This has a complex microstructure. So, our first of idea of modeling or complex microstructure is to uh, is to uh, use this sort of crazy paving model. So uh, the thought thinking behind that is that when Ben produced some uh, some micrographs of this uh, structure, we saw the, these planar layers of the graphite. So if he's looking at edge on, you see some thirty nanometer thick layer, and then if you slice it direction you do see sort of different different size grains. So the idea here is that we're building these sort of polycrystalline models where you have a structure built up out of several slabs of uh, graphite. So with each slab it's like an A B H O E G slab of graphite, but then they the, the random shapes and random orientation. And when you do that, you get sort of complex grain boundary structures. So where you have a grain boundary, you, know, you end up with a, this is described by a series of five and seven member rings. So there's some existing code in the literature to do that, and uh, modified this slightly so that we can uh, displace each of these uh, layers. You get, uh, so A, B stacking on each side, you can get this graphite grain boundary structure and we found both react perhaps a better and rebo model these uh, these grain boundaries quite well. Um, and what's most, and I'll just 
and I'll just leave it on here where I've just introduced an extra interstitial defect on the main boundary, which is cap. There's this interstitial defect on the uh, surface of, uh, of the surface of plane that was captured by this uh, 5 7 green defect on the main boundary. So we think there's some, some possibility of capturing some of these defects on these main boundaries, which is a uh, subject for some future work. Okay, thank you very much, Kenny. <laughs> we do have time for two quick questions. Chris. I've got the microphone as well. Um, if you took the buckle model uh, with lots of interstitials and buckle sheets and you heat them up with a Rebo or XFF, do you see it transform into the ruck and tuck? Uh, that's something we've not tried. Um, I would expect if we heated the structure up to a high enough temperature, if, 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 if you're talking about this model, you're talking about this model, like this, I mean, and, and to take a structure like this and heat it up. The answer is no. The spirals move together to form these rings, these ring type structures. Yeah, that's what I think I was going to uh, suggest that these, if you heat, we, these, the this diffusion barriers is going to be something like 1, 1.2 EB to move this. So if at a high enough temperatures, these spirals will diffuse, and as we've seen in those other simulations, they come together to form these sort of plate pitch structures. So, so I think you would get platelets. I think what you've what you shown, Kenny, is uh, that where you get compression, where, where you get compression of grains, you get these rock and tuck things forming, but not so much from the spirals because the spirals seem to form together to form rings. But where you get expansion, say, of one grain pressing against another, that causes it. I think. It's an open question that is Malcolm's legacy. One final, one final question, Ben. Uh, very interesting. Um, the um, single vacancy that you had, uh, which were sort of uh, um, more or less planar, uh, four coordinated uh, SP3 type carbon, is are the surrounding uh, graphitic carbon atoms actually allowed to come out of the plane? So you could sort of re release some of that stress of having a, uh, you know, so that it goes into sort of a different kind of spiral kind of en environment. Uh, I mean, is it, is it are the other carbon atoms constrained to no, the plane or they can move out here? Yeah. No, we did not constrain in the, uh, in the sea direction. Okay. Second question. Can, can yeah. I just answer something quickly on that? One of the things that's come out of this is that once the layers bend, all the barriers change. So that a lot of these barrier calculations that are done both with AIM Pro and with um, when you've got flat planes, but you bend the plane a bit, and the um, the, the type of vacancies, which is the most stable, changes, <laughs> which is amazing. You know, so. Uh, since all these um, in a real reactor, everything's at high temperature, so you can't really say which <laughs> which vacancy is, is going to how how it's going to diffuse. Sorry, last. <laughs> okay, so sorry. The second part of my question was: um, I, I really like the uh, simulation of sort of these clusters of spirals and what they were doing, and uh, I think it was twenty such defects that you chose. Uh, have you chosen like smaller numbers? Or, well, I was thinking it's like you're sort of doing some really interesting kind of 
carbon only kind of chemistry in a sort of electrophilic type of environment given from the, uh, the, the two layers, you know, sort of the electron density being kind of high, higher there. So I'm thinking sort of a kind of, sort of chemist rather than a solid state kind of view. <laughs> So, I think we've only done. Yeah, I think we've only done uh, simulations where we've used between 16 and uh, 40 interstitial um, spiros to form these platelets. Uh, but we've not, uh, in this work, we've not modelled any any other elements. And in fact, the reactive F doesn't. It's just an uh, interaction between the atoms. It doesn't uh, model the electrons, anything like that. So it's just, it's just basically Newton's law and the reactive F gives a, good, a model for the forces between the atoms. Um, but yeah, that's all we've, okay, we've done. Okay, I think we need to move on. Well, thank you very much. Yes. And that's the next. So.